Welcome back to another edition of Chat Call. Don't forget to subscribe to Chat Call the newsletter on FreightWaves.com if you haven't already. Today we welcome the one and only Alfonso Quijano, Chief Technology Officer at Lean Solutions Group. Welcome to the show, Alfonso. Thank you so much for having me, Mary. We're really excited. I am excited to get into today's topic, not only because we are going to touch a little bit on nearshoring, but we're also getting into some of those practical app, those practical applications of it and kind of what that looks like on a day to day. But before we get too far into it, let's get some background on you and how you got started at Lean Solutions. Absolutely. Where do I start? Just from the beginning, I came out of the, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so... I joined the Lean Solutions Group in uh, 2016. It seems like forever now. Um, we were probably 60, 60 employees, give or take. Um, and we wanted to do something in technology. I spoke with Robert about big plans that were coming into the future. And just started working together and you know grinding for the next four years uh, until we got uh, big enough to think about having our own technology division. Um, so at that point, I became a shareholder. I uh, got my own sort of company within a company, uh, which was Lean Tech, and we grew that. We grew that bad boy to you know what it's today. It was about 800 or so developers, and we have 120 customers uh, across North America with a lot of impact in the logistics industry. And uh, that's how I got to be where I am today. I feel like that had to come at the perfect time because like you said, you were starting around 2020 and um, also what a way to start a, what a way to start a company, a company within a company. So you're kind of already like, you, you, you can't fail, but you also could, but also there's a very nice support system there to help you. Um, but I feel like that had to be the perfect time because as all of trucking and supply chain kind of got its glow up and its tech, it's like major investment in technology in that time, I feel like you guys were perfectly poised at the right time to come in and be like, we've got your pro, we've got your solutions. Yeah. And, oh, and then, um, COVID hit, you know, believe it or not, I think that was the best thing that could ever happen to us. And people were just like, remote work, let's go. You know, we don't have a choice. So <laughs> it kind of made us the, you know, the favorite uh, kid around the block. And uh, it really helped us grow for sure. Um, and I think it's, it's also positioned us very well. Like we, there was nobody doing this when we started it back in the day. Now there's tons of like, I mean, I don't want to be mean, but they're, they're the copycats. You know, we started it. Um, but yeah, that's another story. I mean, it feels like everywhere, like literally everywhere you go, someone is going nearshoring this, nearshoring that. Um, it's kind of that everyone's making those moves to put some investment in Mexico specifically. And then also, you know, there is kind of that oh, I'm going to have some back office support. And there is kind of that huge push to have all of these nearshored solutions. Um, but honestly, when it comes to putting that like pen to paper in real life of, okay, we've set up this office in Mexico. We've, uh, you know, hired some people in Colombia with lean solutions. We've had people over in Poland or whatever. We have this, this, this new workforce that we're working with. How difficult is it? And what are some of those hiccups that come with trying to integrate an office, whether like specifically internationally, like what kind of hiccups are people seeing? What, what kind of hiccups are you seeing with people the most off of them? Yeah. So great question. Um, I think you can answer it in, in many ways because I feel like uh, companies go through different stages to be ready to do nearshore. Um, some companies do it, you know, very young when they're starting out, um, like in technology company startups, and they feel like they, you know, want to get something done quickly with a company that has experience in logistics. Um, amazing experience with uh, Cassandra from Kira Sure, for example, um, big development team with us. And like, she's, she has a big advocate of lean as well, but she, she has a, a, a successful company and a product because of the stage in which she's decided to partner up with us in Nearshore. Um, otherwise it would have been too costly and, um, just, you know, really difficult to get off the ground, uh, on the operation side, some customers do it when they're a little more mature and they have some very tough decision makers on their side that can come down and train the team, literally like pass on the baton to people that are in Colombia. that like, we see it all the time. We have rooms that are designed for training and we take pictures of that all the time where, you know, you see the most vocal person in your company, like, you know who it is, the person that likes to go and like, tell people, yeah, like I'll say um, Jordan Reber, 
uh, from ARL. Day one hustle. I see him all the time. Like he's in Colombia. Day one hustle. Let's go. Like that, like transmission of, of um, like the energy back to the team. That's really important. Um, we handle the rest. Like we put in the processes. We make sure that people are motivated when you're not here and that you're getting sort of like that state of the art um I want to say operation uh, that mirrors whatever you have in the States. I really like that because it kind of reflects back to the you get out of it what you put into it type thing. And so obviously if you're engaged and, you know, willing to kind of go the extra mile and make people feel part of the team or part of their their uh, part included, then I think that really kind of reflects back in the quality of work that you're getting and also uh, versus just being like, here's an assignment. Let me know when you're done with it. Here's something else. Let me know when you're done with it. Cause I feel like you really do get out of it, what you put into it. For sure. And like, you should expect your near shore partner, you know, now that there's so many, I guess like people now have the ability to choose which one's best. So if you're going to choose, choose one that's giving something back to you. Like you're not just going over there to transmit all of your stuff to the partner and assume that that's the way you do it. Um, the way you do it is you establish some, um, some processes initially, and then you, you start to like, really like demand, like request. And like, what does that demand look like? Um, in terms of analytics, um, what we do in workforce analytics is spectacular. Like we give, um, sort of like ultimate visibility to our customers about their operation that honestly, they wouldn't otherwise think of doing because, Again, bandwidth and like other things. Um, it's more capacity thing, but um, all those things you can expect for your your near shore partner to do, and then you start to elevate that a little bit more, and then you get into technology. It's like what technology are is your near shore partner helping you? Um, I don't know, like dip your toes on and actually look at uh, that you didn't consider before. All those things are important. I think that it's something that we come back to time and time again on this show is that is, you know, making sure that you have a partner that really is working with you and kind of is invested in your future and in your success because you don't want to work with this partner and then have them be like, sorry, that support ticket, I'll get to it in like two weeks. Meh we'll get there. And I think that really kind of having that partner that's invested with you has to be instrumental. Um, but I guess when it comes to kind of that technology aspect of it, like you said, you want to, you'll be reaching out to a partner for maybe integrating a new technology or something else. But what are some of the most common things that you're seeing from your partners saying like, Hey, we want more of this. Hey, we, we are trying to implement this. Is it anything kind of in that AI and machine learning space? Or is it more of like, we're really just trying to get these two old systems to talk to each other and get some data moved over. For sure. I think the word that's been going around the most is performance, performance management, performance data. Um, people are trying to get more bang out of their buck. I think that's a conversation that we had all throughout 2023 with, you know, having sort of a little bit more of a soft market and like with things changing, um, from all sides, even from like an investment perspective, companies are not raising as much money in the same stages as they were before. So they got to, you know, look at where they allocate their monies as much as possible. But when they come to us now, they're, they're talking about how do I maximize my investment? Because it is an investment. Like we, we know that when you're coming to lean, you're coming for a couple of reasons, right? And I think on the top of that list, you can say that cost is a big factor. You want to have some type of return on investment. Um, because it, it's really hard to scale your team um, in your in-house operation. It's really costly. Uh, maybe there's not availability of people. Like there's uh, tons of factors. But I think that when you have already made the investment, now you're looking at ways to maximize that even further, right? Even if you're saving the 30, 40% that you save right off the bat with us, you're like, how do I get more value? And that is starting to change dramatically with a couple of new tools that are out in the market um, that allow you to see this data in front of you. Um, hence why we did this partnership with uh, ISO, Isometric Technologies, um, with Brian. So kudos to Brian. He's a great guy and his team are all amazing. Um, they're paving the way for a really cool future in logistics, one where it's performance-based. Um, so that 
among many others are, are some of those um, that we try to guide customers towards doing. Yeah. Well, uh, ISO is a friend. I, I like to call him a friend of the show. Uh, we've had them on a few times. They have a fantastic, um, you can catch some of those old episodes here on YouTube. Uh, they have some fantastic scorecarding technology that is coming out and is just honestly, you say if you hear scorecarding, and you're like, what? It, it's scorecarding. No, it's actually like, it's much better than that. It's fantastic. Um, I absolutely adore it. Um, but I'm glad that I'm glad to know that you guys are, are back there helping them. I love when, I love when two friends of the shows get together behind the scenes. Absolutely. hundred percent. So I guess when, cause you guys are, I mean, you guys kind of know what people are looking for. Um, and you have, you kind of have your finger on your pulse there, but how do you kind of make sure that, you know, what a customer is asking for. So if you have someone saying, Hey, I need these two systems to be able to pass a data file between them because getting rid of this antiquated system is just not an option. Do you ever kind of have to have those conversations with a customer of like, Hey, this legacy TMS or this legacy system that you have, it might be time for it to go. Do you guys ever have to kind of like coach your customers on like this? It, we got to move into the 21st century now. We have been doing this for many years now. And again, it's changed dramatically in the last year because the leeway that you had to have those systems has, has also changed. Like now you have much less. Um, well, what was happening before was this was kind of like the cycle. So you have an antiquated technology in your company and you're looking to work with lean. And not only are you looking to do some operation stuff, but you're looking to get some developers and do some integration work because you want to connect, hey, Project 44 came around and you want to connect this data back to your, I don't know, your AS400. And it turns out that we say, like, I, we, we can't find developers to uh, know how to integrate that. It's like, it's not a thing that like, people want to actually do that. So all of a sudden you're, you're stuck in this um, like there's no people to do what you're going to do, but you're trying to get out of the, so that vicious cycle is, is dangerous and it gets tougher to get out of um, as, as time passes. So what we do is that we, we actually coach our customers, just like you mentioned, and we create growth paths for them. So um, these growth paths involve, um, Hey, do you have a data warehouse? Um, so we create work for ourselves. I always tell them like, I, I want to, I want to help you and like, I'll do some like free consulting so that I have enough of a roadmap to um, like know what to work on. That's important for you. And um, I'll take that off your back. And I also sort of make you future proof. Um, some customers listen to us, some, some don't, um, which I mean, that's okay. They, they come back. Um, but yeah, that's normally how it goes. I like that. I mean, first of all, if you have a magic solution to get any of your, any and all of your customers to listen to exactly what you've said and implement it the first time, that right there uh, is going to be your trillion dollar idea because um, I, we love our customers. They're fantastic and wonderful, but sometimes if they just would have listened to what we said in the first place, it would have been a much smoother situation. But unfortunately everyone does have autonomy and agency and we can't force people to do what we want them to do. That's a hundred percent right. But it's, I mean, it's okay. Like I think that, um, Man, I think that's, this is tough, like what I'm going to say, but like, it's like evolution for you, right? Like some will just, you know, come out on top and like, they'll, they'll be like the next generation of brokers that have the technology and the automation and they'll figure out the data stuff. And then there are others that they, unfortunately, they, they, you know, they didn't. Right. Um, and uh, it's just, I think there's a, there's a place for everyone in, in, in today's world. Yeah, there's never uh, a favorite saying of mine is there's plenty of freight to go around. It's not like the freight is magically going to disappear or go away uh, if one more person enters the market. Like there's plenty of freight to go around. Correct. Correct. So I guess when it comes to like measuring for success, like obviously when a project's done and something is integrated or a system is developed or, you know, you guys have helped to create this thing that is now on the market available for purchase. Obviously that's a pretty clear indicator that you've been successful and you've completed the job, but how do you really kind of measure that success as you're going throughout that process? Cause like you said, every customer is different. Every requirement's different. 
And so that means every marker for success and making sure that that happy, that customer satisfaction is there. How do you kind of measure that throughout the process to know that we are actually doing the right thing and we are following through on what we've promised? Okay, so I love this question. I mean, this is like, I, don't know, I could spend hours on this. So um, I think that, and I'm going to be a little, like, I'm going to go a little out there, right? So um, I think that there's a combination of three pillars that give you the right answer for that. It's like, how do you know you're doing well? And I think the first pillar is called talent, right? The second pillar is performance. And the third pillar is maturity. And I think there is a combination of these three elements. Um, I call it, you know, they could be formed like in a Venn diagram where they relate each other. But the person who has a grasp on these three, and by person, I mean really the account, customer, like the team, um, has success within Lean. And it's, it's very um, sort of like when you get into each of them, there's a way to rank um, how you're doing in each of these pillars that are so important to us. Like if you look at talent, for example, um, you have some obvious ones, like for example, attrition. You, you can't run a team that's constantly, you know, in, out, et cetera. You, you, you have to have a predictable attrition, right? And like, we know that's always been sort of an issue and we're really good at that. We have uh, very low attrition. Um, so single digit, it's, it's great. It's one of the reasons why customers keep coming back. Um, but on top of that, there's a whole other uh, set of objective metrics that are unique to each customer, um, unique, unique to each company. And they manage how people feel at a individual level and how you can know if a person is, um, they like what they're doing. Uh, and, and this is why I said it gets a little like intricate, but uh, how do you know if someone, for example, is okay at the day and time in which you're doing a task? And uh, I think Apple solved it really well. And uh, they sent this little thing, I don't know, like the mindfulness event in which you say if you're doing fine or you're doing, you know, you're kind of good. And they send that on a daily basis. They have a huge database of how people are feeling now at all times. And they use that to send ads and stuff. So basically that formula, we found it within Lean. And we found a way, we have some technology that we deployed in order to get that. Um, at all times. We call it the active health pulse of the organization. It's a product called MoodCube. And with about 10 other metrics on the talent side, we're able to rank customers and know which customers are doing things right, which customers are doing things wrong. And now for the first time ever, we're going to start sort of releasing some of this information back to our customers so they can make help make decisions and say, I want to go from number 10 to number one. And now I know, now I know what I can do. Now, take everything I said and just to not, you know, take too long on this part and apply it to the performance side and then apply it to the maturity side and say maturity, technology, processes, um, like what technology do I need to have if I'm a big broker? And like, who is defining these things for companies today? Um, I want to say no one is and like people will correct me probably if, if there is a whole bunch of people, but not an easy way to access. And I think Lean could be that, um, that entity, that person. I absolutely love that because honestly, you're right. There isn't really a great benchmark of like, this is where you rank compared to your counterparts, your, you know, the other half. Um, there's not really a great solution out there for it other than just like, oh yeah, I'm also using this TMS system. Okay. But like, how are you using it? How do you have it integrated? Are you using it fully or are you only using a little bit of it? And there really isn't that good benchmark solution out there. And it's, I mean, people desperately want it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and look, I think, um, I think I, I get this question a lot about the future um, and like where we're going. And um, if you ask some people about like AI and like the tools that are out there, um, they'll say like, Oh, people with like terrible experience will say like, Oh, it doesn't work because I, you know, tried it once and I spend a whole bunch of money and it just, you know, it wasn't right. Um, there is such a thing at applying the right technology at the wrong time. And I feel tons of companies are going to do this. They're going to all there. A lot of them are going to make this mistake. And it's imagine the flow of innovation that we're going through right now. It's 
First, we had the chat GPT uh, chat bots. So I'm not sure if you've like seen a lot of people saying like, like, hey, um, corporations, enterprises, like we don't want, we're tired of chat bots. Stop selling me your chat bot. Like we don't, we don't want that. Like what we want is true enterprise AI that can help automate tasks. So imagine we went from the chat bot and now we're going to full democratization of like chat GPT tools. Everything has like AI embedded in the tool, all that stuff. So what comes next? The next piece is AI agents. So how can you have fully autonomous uh, tools that can help make decisions for you? And these decisions will have to be smart and they'll have to mimic what a person would do, but not to replace that person to enhance their operation. The only way that you can have an AI agent do what you do and do it well is if you have a true foundation of data. That's a benchmark. That's a scorecard. That's how do you know which care is better than the other one? How do you know that this technology is better than the other one? So what people are doing, and hopefully everyone will see it kind of like where I'm going with this, is like we're laying the foundation of the right data that you're supposed to put out there so that then all those processes can be automated in one way or another. Um, and, and we're going to participate very heavily in that in the in the near future. I 100% love that because, I mean, I'm a big time advocate of automate what you hate and automate those time consuming things. Because honestly, if you are sitting there having someone manually move things over because some system somewhere isn't implemented correctly and it's not working, like just fix the implementation and fix that. So that way you can have people working on, they should be working on the exceptions and the things that don't fit into the normal workflow. They shouldn't be working on things that are supposed to be no touch or supposed to automatically flow through things. It's supposed to be, you're supposed to be working on those exceptions and managing that, handling the things that aren't easily managed. You know, the things that there's always, cause there's always going to be that one load that blew up and is a disaster. And like there's that you're just going to hate that you ever took. And so that's why it's really important that, you know, we are creating solutions that do automate the things that we don't like and that are, that are easy. And so that way we have time to deal with the, the harder stuff. I had to look this up cause I was going to completely destroy this quote, but I love this quote, which is, I want AI to do my laundry and dishes so that I can do art and writing, not for AI to do my art and writing so I can go do my laundry and dishes. And I think it's super powerful. Like, don't you think? Because um, it's like you should think about AI as a way for you to get the creatives to do more stuff. Like you want, you want those people to be out there and thinking and like, you know, I can take a chat GPT and like throw a bunch of images and say like, figure this out. Right. So that like, I can go and think about what I'm going to do with that. Um, and I think that's, that's the, that's like the next thing, right. It's like, what's the, what's the correct way to really apply it. If you try to apply it towards your thinkers, like a lot of people are doing, um, like in your, you know, a lot of your customer service piece, I, I consider that a thinking piece. Um, why do I say that? Because that a lot of people call that the the meat and potatoes of their business is like how well they treat their customers. Um, it's not necessarily how fast. It's not necessarily how um, like it's it's the quality that you put behind it, right? And I think those are things that are going to um, remain in time, like. Uh, taking like I'm a big quote guy, so sorry, uh, but like Jeff Bezos, right? He said, a lot of people are thinking about how to create businesses based on things that change very often and that can be disrupted. But very few people are thinking about businesses that uh, are very, uh, creating businesses around things that don't change, around things that stay the same. And like, what are some of those things? People are going to want things quickly. They're going to want things with good customer service. They're going to want things that um, that work. You know, you don't have to go and ask a whole bunch of times, you know, how, how it. So that's why Amazon is built the way it is, right? Um, kudos to Amazon, you know. Just, um, but yeah. 
I mean, thinking, speaking of thinkers, I have a question that might require arguably some of the most brain power you might be asked today. And it's a question that everyone that comes on the show has to answer. Uh, and I, are you ready for it, Alfonso? It's a good one. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, all right. Yeah. To you, whatever brain power I have, I'll use it for this. I swear. Is a hot dog considered a sandwich? Ooh. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a thinker. Let's see. Um, I want to go with absolutely not because I'm Colombian and like we have our roots and, and like we, I think a lot of people don't know this, but like we're big hot dog people. Like I think, um, so there's a whole variety of different hot dogs in Colombia and, but they put like everything on it. It's not just like, you know, ketchup and mustard. They put cheese and it's like, I'm going to say the word, but Italo Suizo Hawaiiano, for example. So that's an Italian, Swiss, Hawaiian hot dog. And it has everything on it. Um, and that, and it's, that's so good, by the way. If you come to Colombia, you know, do that. But, um, but that's its own thing. Uh, and w- whereas like a sandwich, sandwiches, I mean, I'll say, look, do you know what an arepa is? Yeah, it's the, uh, it's usually, well, I mean, I've always had cheese filled ones, but it's like a little, right. like, like a little. Is that a sandwich? I don't think so. It's not. That's it's like, a whole it's take, its own thing yeah you can't take two like things and go, put something in the middle and call it a sandwich exactly when you go get an arepa you don't get an arepa sandwich <laughs> i'm very serious about this this is this is your serious stuff definitely not a sandwich hopefully everyone got that all right so if someone um you know has a line on the best hot dog in Colombia, or if they have any other questions for you where can they find you outside the show Cool. So I'm trying to, you know, make a, a sort of a big LinkedIn um, presence. So like, if you want to follow me on LinkedIn and hear all about what's happening in tech, feel free to do so. Um, is there like a hashtag or something in, in LinkedIn? Just put Alfonso Quijano. We'll probably show up. Um, other than that, leangroup.com, um, www.leangroup.com. Tons of information there about our services and what we do. Um and uh, regarding the hot dog question, that's a, that's a good one. There's just so many. Um, you'll have to come to Columbia and see. Like, otherwise, no tips. Awesome. All right. Well, you guys heard it here first. Alfonso's DMs are open. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. You can find Chat Call the Podcast anywhere you get your podcasts, like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Don't forget to check out all the other incredible FreightWave shows, and don't forget to subscribe to the newsletter on FreightWaves.com slash Chat Call. See you on the internet.